joining Vanguard Lions, Devin Blankenship here, your BSC president. Today for praise and worship, we are having the Tristone Missionary Baptist Choir come to sing for us today. They are a part of the Tristone Missionary Baptist Church in Carson, California. And if you are interested in their music, they have uh, their album on Apple Music if you would like to check it out. And I hope that you enjoy. So everyone, please welcome the Tristone Missionary Baptist Choir. I need you. You need me, we're all a part of God's body, stand with me, agree with me, we're all a part of God's body, it is his will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. I need you to survive. You are important to me. I need you to survive. I prayed for you. You prayed for me. I love you. I need you to survive. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. I love you. I need you to survive. I pray for you. You pray for me. I love you. I need you to survive. I won't harm you. I love you, I need you to survive. I pray for you, you pray for me. I love you, I need you to survive. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. I love you, I need you to survive. I pray for you. You pray for me. I love you. I need you to survive. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. I love you. I need you to survive. It is his will that it
Praise the Lord, Vanguard Lions. This is Grace Israel from BS Youth. Today we have our first speaker for Honor Week of Black History Month, Dr. Terrell B. Sales. Dr. Terrell Sales is the Assistant Professor of Graduate Education here at Vanguard. He began his teaching journey here at Vanguard in 2017, equipping students to become the best teachers they can be. He also serves as the BSU advisor for this school year. Aside from his school commitments, he loves preaching and teaching God's word. But most of all, he loves being a faithful husband and committed father. Please, everyone, welcome Dr. Terrell B. Sales. Good morning, uh, Vanguard. It's a pleasure to be with you. My name is uh, Dr. Terrell Sales, and uh, I'm very happy to be with you today to be able to bring you God's word. Um, we're talking about legends, heroes of the faith, and we find ourselves in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. So I'm gonna jump right in after a prayer. We're gonna get started today. We're gonna focus on Moses and how Moses, um, his life can speak to our lives and uh, what God is, is telling to Moses. And the title of this sermon is called Certainly I Am With You. And we'll see why that's important later. Again, the title is Certainly I Am With You. So let's pray. Um, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. We ask that you speak to us today, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, move on the hearts of those who are listening. Move on my heart, Holy Spirit. Forgive me of any sin that I've done. It's unlike you. Um, cleanse me, wash me clean, um, that I may be able to present your word um, with a clear conscience and a pure heart because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Um, Lord Jesus, I thank you for all that you've done, for dying on the cross for my sins, um, and just helping us, Lord Jesus, um, become more and more like you. Um, Father God, we thank you for loving us so much, for setting the the uh, salvation in motion, Lord God, um, by sending your son and then Jesus sending the Holy Spirit. So we just thank you. So be with us today and just help us, Lord God. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right. So we're going to start in Hebrews. So if you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, uh, Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to start at verse 23. And it reads, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was unseen by faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. Now this sounds fantastic and this is true. He's, he's mentioned in the Hall of Faith, but I want us to look at the full picture of Moses. So if you do, you turn back to the book of Exodus chapter three and we're gonna read where the Lord God um, commissioned Moses to go back to Egypt, right? And we're in Exodus chapter three, um, and we're gonna start at verse 10. It says, therefore come now and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel out of Egypt. This is God speaking. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, certainly I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Then Moses said to God, behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel and I will say to him, to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. See, certainly I am with you. See, you see what I did there? And it says, God furthermore said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. 
This is my memorial name to all generations. So Moses is unique because he is what you would call bicultural. Okay, he's a son of both Egypt and a son of Israel. He was raised in the customs and cultures of two very distinct people groups, well-educated in both. So he was well-educated in the Israel history and well-educated in the Egyptian history. So each culture had its own set of standards for living, for worship, for eating, for dressing, for socializing, et cetera. And he spent 40 years in this dichotomy of cultures, which made him the perfect person for the work God had for him to accomplish. See, he knew the cultural dynamics of Egyptian life as well as Hebrew life. We have a bunch of bicultural people at Vanguard University as well. And there are many of you who have had the benefit of living in one culture, one way of life, and have now been introduced to a new way of living, a new life, and an abundant life in Jesus Christ. Although he didn't know it yet, Moses was the perfect person to fulfill the work that God had called him to complete. However, in order to do God's work, there has to be a proper maturation process. Although we might have the knowledge that comes with being bicultural, we might not have the experience that should also accompany that knowledge. Sometimes you might have the understanding, but you might not have the expertise. Like with Moses, sometimes just because you have the knowledge and understanding to do the work does not mean that you have the maturity, the experience, and the attributes to carry out what God has intended. See, back in Exodus 2, Moses gained greater understanding of his Israelite heritage and that forced him to like no longer sit by and watch his people suffer. Sometimes, although we know what's going on, we don't fully understand what's going on. So just like with Moses, you have your Egyptian ties and you have seen what's been going on for years, but you don't do anything about it. You see your family members suffering in sin. You see your friends suffering in sin. People who you were once a part of living those lives with and you used to live those lives with those people, you see them suffering and you see them in their sin and you see them back in Egypt, but yet you do nothing about it. You like Moses just continue to live your life in comfort and seclusion until one day is gonna hit you just like it hit Moses. And Moses did suffer, but it wasn't how God intended for him to do it. So Moses sees his brother being mistreated and we know the story by an Egyptian and what does he do? He thinks he's going to work for God or do for God by, by, uh, by saving his brethren, but he doesn't do it God's way. What does Moses do? He kills him. He murders him. And this is not how God intended to use Moses to deliver his people. So here Moses had the knowledge, the understanding that something wrong was going on to his people, but lacked the maturity and the experience to carry it out how God intended him to do so. So what happens? He spends 40 years in the wilderness, right? Now it takes the wilderness experience for Moses to learn the attributes that are necessary to lead people, to care for people, to tend to the needs of others before his own. It takes a wilderness experience for Moses to grow into the man that God can use for the calling that God had put on his life. See, he leaves the palace of Egypt to become a shepherd of sheep in the desert. And by him becoming that shepherd and having that experience in the desert, he learns compassion. He learns patience. He gains greater wisdom, not earthly wisdom, but what James calls godly wisdom. He gets greater understanding. He develops meekness and long suffering as a result of that wilderness experience. And while he's in that isolation, what happens is he becomes completely bare before God. And now God can take all that knowledge and understanding that he gained from that wilderness experience, from being a son of Egypt, right? And a son of Israel, all, the, all that ex experience that he has gained from being a shepherd. And now because of that, God can use him to do the work that he has called him to do before the foundation of the world. See, it took 40 years for God to work this out in Moses. He spent 40 years in Egypt and then 40 years in the, in the wilderness. So Moses is now 80 years old when God calls him. So for all of you out there who like, I know you guys are in, in, in college and you're pretty young, but a lot of you feel a lot of pressure right now to like, man, I should be doing what God has called me to do. You know, I've been serving the Lord for this amount of time. It doesn't matter how old you are. God will call you when he has fully equipped you to do his work, okay? You're never too old or too young to do the work that God has set out for you to do because he set it out for you to do before the foundation of the world anyway. So what's the application, Brother Sales, or you know, Professor Sales, or whatever you want to call me, what's, what's the application? 
The application is whatever ministry God has placed in you to accomplish, your age has nothing to do with it. Get to work and trust that God will be with you just as he promised to be with Moses. See, so many times we want to make it about ourselves, but this whole thing is about God. The entire exodus was about God displaying his power in the deliverance of his people. Did God need Moses to do this? No, but guess what? He chose him to do it and to be the vessel that will illustrate his power to Egypt. And at that time, Egypt was the greatest, you know, nation in the world, right? So he was displaying his power to the world. So God in his divine providence chooses to use who he chooses to use. The question is, do you have the faith, right? So what Hebrews 11 is about, like the, the, the hall of faith, right? Do you have the faith to trust God's choosing? Do you trust God's judgment of who you are? Not your own judgment of who you are. God knows what's inside of you and how he can maximize your character traits, your personality, your experiences, your knowledge, your understanding to fulfill not your will, but his will and his plan for your life. The question is, will you trust and have faith in God to do it? Do you actually trust in God's character? Do you trust his person, his experience, his knowledge, his understanding? God is calling many of you at Vanguard University, just like he called Moses to do something amazing for his glory where he can display his power in your lives. Trust who it is that is calling you. You know, sometimes we put too much trust in ourselves. Trust who it is that's calling you. If God is calling you to do something, do it. Just as Moses had to fully trust who it was that was calling him. God wanted to leave no doubt in Moses' mind, which is why we see what happens next in the narrative so vividly. So if you go back to Exodus 2, I think it's important for us to go back there really quick. So we see that God calls Moses. I'm sorry, Exodus 3. We see God calls Moses, right? And what does he tell them? He says, certainly I will be with you and this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. So we have to gain greater clarity on who is talking to Moses at this time. Because if you look, it says, uh, let's go back up to, to uh, chapter, in, still in chapter three, it says, um, verse two says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses says, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up, right? When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, he called him by name. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He, sa he said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. So now let's understand who's calling you, right? Or in this case, who was calling Moses? We have to gain greater clarity on who exactly this angel is. See, this angel has appeared throughout the biblical narrative, right? In Genesis 16, 7 through 11, he appeared to Hagar in the desert, you know, when Sarah kicked her out and all that drama was going on. In Genesis 21, 17, he appeared to Hagar and Ishmael again. In Genesis 22, 11 through 15, he appeared to Abraham on the mountain where he was going to sacrifice Isaac. He also appeared in Genesis 31, 11 when he called Jacob to leave for Canaan. So understanding who this angel is is essential to the biblical narrative but also it's imperative to the purpose of this text and the exodus of the children of Israel. So this is not just any old angel who's calling Moses, this is not any old person. This is the angel of Yahweh, which many commentators believe to be a representative of God, but not, I'm sorry, they don't believe it to be a representative of God, but they believe it to be God himself, right? So this who's calling Moses is not some representative of God, is God himself. So when God is calling you, it's God himself, the creator of the universe is calling you to do a work that he has predestined for you to do before the foundation of the world. See, in this chapter, the angel of Yahweh is Yahweh, but not in the form of a man, 
or the form of an angel, but he appears here in the form of a burning bush. Now, before we get to the bush, let's dive a bit deeper into Yahweh, see? See, no man can look upon God and live, right? So God chose in his divine wisdom to represent himself to Moses in this unique way. But the difference between this angel and the other angels that he sent in previous iterations is that this angel bears the name of God, okay? This angel has Yahweh's name in him. This is a name that is unspeakable. It's, this name is so unspeakable that Hebrews merely refer to it as the name. Like that's what they, they don't say. They, they, but when you're talking about the name, they know who you're talking about. The name was so holy that they wouldn't even write it out fully, right? And when they did write the name, they would just like throw the pen away after they wrote it and pick up another pen and start writing. That's how holy this name is. That's who's calling you to do the work that he has called you to do. So this is powerful. This, this, this text here is powerful. We don't want to just read over it, right, and skip to Hebrews. We want to dig into Exodus. This is a powerful Thing that we're engaging in and this name is important because this name serves as God's revelation of himself to his people God wanted to reveal a little bit more about himself to his people and sometimes when God is calling you to do something for him that's difficult that's challenging what he wants to do is kind of reveal a little bit more about himself to you sometimes we think we have God figured out you know we're studying the scriptures and this that, and the other but our God is inexhaustible and we'll never fully know him, right? He's given us everything we need to know him now, right? In the scriptures, but he, the secret things belongs to God. Like there are so many things about God that we will never know. But sometimes when he calls you to do something that is very difficult, he calls you to your mission in life. He's trying to reveal to you something that's a little bit more in depth about his character, about who he is. And that's what he wanted to do here with his people and with Moses, see? He wanted to reveal just a little bit more about his power, right? They knew about God, but did they really know about God, right? He wanted them to see just a little bit more about his essence. He wants to see that he was just more, he wasn't just this abstract God up there. He wanted them to show like, I am the God of the universe. I control everything, right? So just from this revelation of his name, Moses might not have fully understood who it was that was actually calling him, right? So for Moses' sake, God became what we call a living metaphor in the form of this burning bush to inextricably link his name to the Exodus by revealing to his people the full definition of what this name means. The revelation of his name is essential to the purpose of his manifestation in this burning bush. So he's gonna use this metaphor of the burning bush to illustrate to them his name. This is great, right? This is great. So let's get to this burning bush. So God chose to reveal himself to Moses in a very particular, I'm, I'm getting too excited. Let me sip this tea real quick. In my Vanguard cup, one more sip. So again, God chose to reveal himself to Moses in a very, very particular and unique way. He chose to reveal himself as a burning bush. Now, there have been many commentators that have studied this revelation of God and come to many conclusions on why God chose to reveal himself in this way. In the mind of God, we have to understand he doesn't do anything arbitrarily or off of impulse. Like, there's always a reason why God does what he does. And he always have a purpose and a divine plan for doing what he does. So, there is a physical and a spiritual reason as to why God chose to reveal himself in this manner. Now, some commentators have argued that this physical representation of God as the burning bush is a metaphor for the children of Israel. You will say, how? How is this a metaphor for the children of Israel? Well, just as the bush is being burned by fire yet never consumed, some commentators believe that this is representative of the children of Israel's bondage in Egypt, right? That although they have been tried by the fire of slavery, death and bondage, they have ceased to be consumed, right? While they're in Egypt, Egypt, they, they never died out. They actually kept multiplying and multiplying and multiplying, right? They were never really consumed by the bondage that they were in. That their God is their ultimate sustainer, right? When he says, they'll be, they'll be. Some even believe that God chose to reveal himself in this way as a perpetual metaphor for the church of God, right? For the church of Christ, for us, the church. That no matter how much the church is persecuted, 
that it will not be consumed and that it too is being spiritually sustained by God as well. Now, although these are wonderful explanations and are plausible descriptions of the bush, I don't think this is why God chose to reveal himself in this way in this text. It doesn't flow with the theology being explained in the narrative of the text. The purpose of the narrative is to reveal to Israel the personhood and the power of God, okay? The focus of the text is not on Israel per se, but on the God of Israel and his revealed name to them, all right? That he is the self-existing, self-sustaining, all-powerful, only God, right? This revelation of God has to flow within the context of the narrative. So although those things might be true and we can, we can say that, I don't think that that is true of this particular text here, right? Within the flow of the narrative using hermeneutics and biblical context. Moses finds himself now seeing God reveal himself in this burning bush and giving him his name. Now let's peep where Moses is. Moses is in a barren, dry desert where something being on fire is not necessarily an uncommon sight because it's dry, right? Any spark can spark a fire. However, this bush is burning, but it's not burning like a normal fire, right? The bush is burning, but it's not being consumed. The fire is not consuming the bush. Not only is this bush burning and not being consumed, excuse me, get too excited but it's also self-contained, meaning that this awesome display of power isn't reckless like regular fire, but is full power, but under control. How is a bush standing alone on fire? Usually that there's sparks flying out, it's a dry desert, and those sparks will find something else to consume, and then they'll burn that up, and then next thing you know, you have a brush fire. But God is trying to show you, no, I'm self-existing, I am, I am self-sustaining and I am in full control. Fire is wild, but God is saying, look, this is power under control. So you can trust me. You can trust this power. Even though I'm all powerful, I'm all, I'm all sustaining, it's power under control. See, the purpose of this revelation, the purpose of God revealing himself in this manner is to show that this God needs nothing to exist, okay? And he's all powerful. And again, like I said, he's fully in control of everything. His power knows no limits, yet it's fully under control, self-contained, and self-sufficient. This is why I believe that although the burning bush can be applied to the children of Israel and applied to the church, in this context here, it shouldn't be. This is the, a, a, a display of the power of the God that we serve and that he will use to reveal himself to Israel and the world through the exodus of Israel and through the use of this man named Moses to do so. Sometimes God is trying to mature us and prep us. He's gonna show his immense power, his, that he's self-sustaining and all these wonderful attributes that we know about God. And he's gonna use little old you to do so to go back to where he has delivered you from, to help bring others into this wonderful faith that we have devoted our lives to. This is about the power of God and his prerogative to choose man to be a part of that plan. God could have did this on his own, but he chose us, he chose Moses, right? In order to do this, this is how we get to Hebrews 11. Now, I don't want to skip over the sandals either because I think that's important. Back in the text, he says, remove your sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Now that we have a clear understanding of who it is that is talking to Moses, naturally we have to approach this God in a very specific way. Moses is instructed to remove his sandals because he is approaching what? Holy ground. The ground was not holy because of the ground or the mountain but because of who was occupying the mountain at that time, because of the presence of the Holy One, Moses could not approach the bush in any kind of way. Moses knew that this was something that was custom even in Egypt in approaching holy places of the Egyptian gods, right? 
However, the difference here is that in those religions, this was done as an act of reverence or respect. So like an example would be like when men enter a building or a court or a church, sometimes they like, you know, they remove my hat. I'm not removing my, I haven't cut my hair yet. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not removing my hat, but you will remove your hat as a sign of respect. Lord, forgive me for my pride, I'm sorry. Uh, but you will remove your hat for a sign of respect, right? But that's not the same here. Here, removing of the sandals in front of God is not just a sign of reverence or respect for God, but according to the Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown's commentary, it says this, the removal of shoes was a confession of personal defilement and conscious unworthiness to stand in the presence of an unspotted holiness. See, in order to be used by God, along with the proper knowledge of who is calling you to do the work, there must come a proper understanding of who you are in relation to a holy God. See, someone who has a vivid understanding of their unworthiness, right? Someone who understands that without God, they're nothing, that without God, they are defiled and ultimately a sinner destined for hell. There has to be both an understanding of who it is that is sending you and also a very vivid understanding of who it is that's being sent. See, when I understand who I am, that makes me completely dependent upon God, that this is not an act of Terrell, that the only way that I'm going to do this, the only way that I'm going to succeed in what God has called me to do is if I stay close to God, if I take out pride from my heart and I approach God and the work that he has called me to do through a heart of humility, okay? See, when you understand who you are, you might even feel unworthy sometimes of such a calling like Moses did. You see, like, he wasn't like, yeah, let's go do this. When he realized how holy God was and who it was that was calling him, he immediately looked at himself and like, yo, I don't feel sufficient. I feel inadequate. I can't do this task, God. But I'm here to tell you that you're right <laughs> and that Moses was right. In and of yourself, you are unworthy, inadequate, insufficient, but with God, all things are possible. He has put you where you're supposed to be. The experiences that you have uh, had in your life, Moses being a child or a son of Egypt for those 40 years, and then a, and then a son of, a son of uh, Israel all of his life, and understanding who he was, and, and then going out to the, all of those things added into who God called Moses to be. Those things are in there. But if I rely on those things that God has put in me and not the God himself, I can find myself in a lot of trouble, right? But what you have to understand is that in God, all things are possible. He can use even you. He can use even me. I didn't think I would be Dr. Sales coming from where I come from. The upbringing that I had, South Central LA, you know, I didn't think I would be here. But God saw something, and with God, all to man, things are impossible, but to God, all things are possible. He used my uniqueness, my story, where I'm from, who I am, all of those things to help me become who the man, the man that I am today. And I'm just, I'm, 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 there's still a long way to go in my journey with God. But what you have to understand is, as an undergraduate or a graduate here at Vanguard University, if God has chosen you to do a work, to start a ministry, to lead a ministry, to assist in the ministry. You are all of those things, right? You are all of those things. But like Moses, if God has chosen you to perform those tasks, you have to trust that he has also equipped you to complete them. The only reason to have any confidence is to place it in the God who has promised to be with you. What does he say in chapter three, verse 12? Certainly what? I will be with you. With all of Moses' doubt, God quickly quells and dispels the doubt by promising Moses that he will certainly be with him. See, God doesn't work in time like we do. He already sees the beginning and the end. He knows it all, right? He sees the finished work that he has told you to embark on. All he requires from you is faith and obedience. This is how we get to Hebrews chapter 11 the legends and the hall of faith and all this wonderful stuff. But there was all kinds of stuff going on before that. But all God requires of us is faith and obedience. He tells Moses that the sign that his word is true 
is the fact that the work has already been accomplished. All Moses had to do was do it. You don't believe me? Go back to Exodus 3, verse 12. He tells Moses, he says, certainly I will be with you and this shall be the sign. What's gonna be the sign that I, that I was with you this whole time? The sign to you that it is I who have sent you. He's saying the, when the work is accomplished, because I already know that I've accomplished the work. All I need from you is obedience. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. The sign that God will be with him the entire time is the fact that they will worship God as freed men and women on the same mountain that God called Moses to go do the work. God says the sign will be when Moses has finished the work of bringing the people of Egypt of uh, the people that are in Egypt, out of Egypt. That's the sign that, that you'll know that I was with you when the work is accomplished. God confirmed that the work will be completed before he even sent Moses. So if God is sending you, he's telling you the work is already completed. All I need from you is faith and obedience. And my last point, and we'll wrap this up, is what is his name, right? So then Moses said to God, so how do you know when you go do what God has called you to do, God has commissioned you to do? How do you know, right? What do you know? What do you know? He's telling you, know who is sending you, okay? Moses says, then Moses said to God, okay, okay, I get that. I get that it's already done and all this other stuff, but we're dealing with people here, right? You're dealing with people, whatever God has called you to do. Then Moses said to God, behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, so when you go and do what God's called you, who gave you the authority to do what you're doing? Who, who gave you this power to be here? Who gave you this authority? Who gave you the, the, the audacity, right, to do this work? Who told you to do this? He says, what is his name? Who told you? Who gave you this? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. Here God doesn't just give him his name, right? He provides to them a description of his name. See, Moses didn't ask, who is it that is sending him? He asked rather, what is his name? The Israelites already knew the name of God. It was time for them to gain clarity on the power that that name holds, right? See, many of us know Jesus. We know the name of Jesus, but they don't know the power that that name holds. Just as Moses received a deeper revelation of God in his encounter with him on, on Mount Herod, so to you, and the children of Israel should gain a greater understanding of the power of God through the Exodus, through what God has called you to do. They knew who God was by name. Now they were going to experience what God is through the revelation of his power. John MacArthur states it this way. Who seeks after title, name, and identity, whereas what inquires into the character, quality, or essence of a person. So just as Moses beheld the image of the self-sustaining, self-existent, fully contained power of God in the form of the burning bush, the children of Israel will be introduced to the great I am through the power displayed in the exodus from Egypt. So when they ask, what is his name? You are to tell them, the self-existent one, the eternal one, the one who is and was and is to come to the rescue. God is saying, my name is I am, and I am is what my name implies. And he's saying that I am and I will put on display my name for all to see. This is the God who is calling you. This is the God who will be with you just as he was with Moses. This is how we get to Hebrews 11, where we see all these wonderful things that Moses did because he had faith and obedience to believe in this God. And just understand that God didn't have to give this deep revelation of who he was to Moses. He didn't owe him that. God didn't have to do any of that stuff, but he did it because he loved him. And it's the same thing with you. He's calling you for work. He's calling you to go back, to not forget who he has created you to be, 
to not forget your, your ethnicity, to not forget your culture, to not forget where he has called you from, to where he is uh, helping you to go. But understanding who it is that's calling you, understanding your own inadequacies, understanding that I have to lean and depend on God in order for this to work. Can't get caught up in myself. This is the God who has chosen you for whatever work he has called you to do here at Vanguard and beyond. With this God at the helm of whatever it is that he's called you to do, there's no room for fear, no room for doubt, no room for excuses. Because if he has called you, he's telling you that I am will sustain you to do the work that is what? That has already been accomplished. All he requires from you is faith and obedience. That's how we get from Exodus to Hebrews. When we're in heaven and we're singing of his praises and we're recounting um, all the good things that God has done, we can be mentioned in that hall of faith as well. Because you have the faith and obedience to believe in the God who sent you and who called you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord God, for all that you've done. We thank you, Lord God, for the message. And we just ask, Lord God, that um, you gave us clearer understanding of, of who you are, Lord. We got to talk about Moses, who's mentioned in the Hall of Faith, Lord God. For Moses was a man just like we are. And you have given us, Lord God, your revelation through your scriptures and through the Holy Spirit, Lord God. And if we are obedient, Lord God, if we seek you, Lord God, for all that you have revealed to us about your character, about your attributes, about your love for us, about how you will never leave us nor forsake us. These are promises that are made by the Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us to take courage because he has already overcome the world. There's nothing that we should fear. No mission that you have, put, that, that you have ordained before the foundation of the world. No, no ministry, Lord God, that we should be afraid of because you have revealed who you are in scripture. And your word is true. And you are not like a man that you should lie. So help us, Lord God, be like Moses with all our fear and trepidation, Lord God. But let us move in faith and obedience to what you have called us to do. So even throughout all of that, when we look back on it, Lord God, we can be mentioned too in the hall of faith. That we have faith and obedience to trust, not just the ministry that you have put in us but to trust you because you put it in us. And if you put it in us, then it's for our good and ultimately for your glory. Christ's name I pray, amen. All right, see you guys around campus sometime. I don't know when, but I'll see you soon. God bless you. Good morning, Vanguard Lions. My name is Devin Blankenship and I'm your BSC president this year. I hope you all have been enjoying chapels this week. Yesterday, we had our first display of our first video, a part of a series called Unsung Heroes. And the purpose of Unsung Heroes is to highlight a person of color that has made major contributions to our society. Sometimes these figures are often in the background or forgotten, but I feel like it's so important to highlight these figures and celebrate them for all the things that they have done. Wise Channel celebrates African Americans who did amazing things. You've probably heard of Thomas Edison. He's the great inventor who invented the incandescent light bulb, batteries, and much more. But there's another inventor you probably don't know, who is known by some as the greatest electrician in the world. Granville T. Woods was born in 1856 in Columbus, Ohio. OH! That's where you're supposed to say I.O. Granville started working at a very young age, and at 10 years old, he worked at a machine shop. This is a dangerous job for a 10-year-old. He later had jobs as a fireman. So hot, 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 hot. Ooh. A steel worker. Seriously? More fire? And shoveling coal into a steam engine on a train. Why are all my jobs so hot? <laughs> After work, Granville went to school to learn about electricity. That education paid off because Granville soon became one of America's best inventors. 
1884, he invented a way to heat homes with a steam boiler. My hot jobs did teach me all about heat. He also invented a new telephone transmitter that made phone calls easier to hear and understand. I can't understand you. Put on that new Granville Woods telephone transmitter. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Thanks, Granville T. Woods. In 1885, Granville invented a way for people to send a message by speaking near a telegraph machine. It's hard to explain what that means, but it's kind of like, instead of just texting, you could talk and text on the same device. It was such a big deal, Alexander Graham Bale bought the patent for the rights to the invention from Woods. Is that enough money? Alex, you have a deal. He also invented the amusement apparatus which led to many amusement park rides. He invented an incubator, which is a box to keep eggs warm enough to hatch. He invented the induction telegraph, allowing railroad engineers and conductors to talk to each other while moving on a train. It was such a big invention, Thomas Edison tried to take credit for it. Edison took Granville to court twice, trying to take away his invention. But Granville Woods won the trials, proving he was the real inventor. After Thomas Edison lost in court, he asked Granville Woods to work for him. Granville said, sorry, Tommy, I'd rather work for myself. Granville T. Woods lived a long time ago, but his inventions still make our lives safer and better today. Let's talk. Granville T. Woods' invention improved the telephone. What would you invent to improve something that already exists? Why do you think Thomas Edison tried to take credit for Granville's big invention? What would you do if someone said something you worked hard to create was really theirs? <laughs>